My name's Jack James and I work at the South London Gallery and uh, I make space for play in my job. Okay, so we've got a space called Art Block, which is the bottom of a tower block on a housing estate that directly neighbours the South London Gallery and it's a space for children to come. We say make things, make friends and play. Okay, it's staffed by the Art and Play team, which I've got the pleasure of uh, managing and children come there after school um, and on Saturdays, and they're mostly they come by themselves. They live really close by, um, and sometimes people are surprised. What you've got six and seven year olds just turning up and doing what they want. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. But we do it in a, an environment which we feel is is safe, but allows them to take the right kind of risks, risks that they're ready to take, and also um, with the support of uh, staff that really care about them making their own independent and playful choices. I think one of the, something we've probably learned today, and probably you all knew it already, is that play is something that's really important. I think it's fair to say that play is something that children will do by themselves without any kind of uh, tampering or kind of uh, intervention by adults. But their ability to play and the quality of their play is impacted by all of us. And I think some of us in this room are gonna go on to be teachers some of us in this room are going to go on to be nurses or social workers or nursery workers. I started my own career working in nursery uh, education myself. And some of us will, will go on to be parents. And I recently became a parent, so if anyone wants to see a picture of my daughter, they can just come up to me like I want to show everyone <coughs> all the time. Uh, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we're very lucky today to have a fantastic panel who are all making space for play in children's life. We're going to in children's lives. We're going to begin with Jane Bradby from Easy Peasy. Easy Peasy are doing a brilliant work where they're looking at how they can create an online platforms for parents to learn cues and props and things to help them to encourage or facilitate the play of their own, their children. Okay. Sometimes as adults we need a little reminder, um, but how is technology affecting children's uh, lives right now? Um, this, these are these questions that we're going to throw over to you, and the, after these three panel talks, it's really up to you guys to make a fantastic Q&A happen. I'm here just to help with that, but like I said, I will be awarding points to the best performing school out of you. Um, wait a sec. Right. Following that, we have Dr. Mat Matluba Khan. Matluba has been working uh, from an education perspective to look at how schools can be made more playful environments, particularly with younger children. She's been working in Bangladesh um, to take maybe quite a formal setup of school and education to expand that out and to look at how nature and the environment impact on children's <laughs> ability to play. And then finally, we have Holly Stoppart. Holly Stop It, sorry, who is Bristol's queen of clowning. And uh, she's a clown teacher, and she's also working with adults to look at how they can be uh, encouraged to be more playful in their lives, and ultimately how this can have a huge impact on their ability to facilitate play for children. So I'm going to first hand over to Jane, and um, look forward to a fantastic Q&A afterwards. Thank you. So thanks for the intro, and Jack described Easy Peasy really well. Um, I am Head of Education at a social enterprise called Easy Peasy. I'm really excited to be here celebrating play today and making space for it. Um, a little bit about me, I completed a Master's in Psychology of Education over at UCL across the road. That was 10 years ago. Um, and I knew since then that I really wanted to work to support people and especially young families to be able to access education and learning, no matter their background. So I really spent the last 10 years doing exactly that and using play-based approaches to do so. So before launching into describing what Easy Peasy is, I wanted to start off with a question today. And that question is, when do you think people learn the most in their lifetime? So I need to have a quick think. And I'm then going to present you with four options. And I invite you to put your hand up when you think people learn the most across these four stages of our lives. So is it A, during university years? Put your hands up if you think you learn the most then. 
Okay. What about B during secondary school? So that's including A levels. So including what, what, lot, what a lot of you are doing now. Okay. Great. And what about C during primary school? Okay. Great. We've got a few more hands there. And what about D during nursery? Okay. Brilliant. Well, a good spread, but most of you opted for D, so I can tell that you've been um, listening um, to, to what's being said today, because indeed, 85% um, of our brain development happens by the age of five. So that's where we're really doing most of that really important learning. Um, we may not be learning facts about history, but we're really developing those key skills and forming important neural connections that give us the skills to, for example, recognize if a friend is feeling sad, or maybe calculate your travel plans to get to college on time or to get here on time, or even to be able to listen to someone speaking and understand what they're saying, exactly as you're doing now. So we might not remember all of this learning that happens uh, when we're very young, but this is really the stuff that forms who we are and how we all interact in the world as adults. Um, so how does play fit into this? Michael Rosen talked about learning through play as trying and testing and, and doing that without fear of failure. And I also wanted to share what Dr. Stuart Brown, um, how he sums learning through play. Dr. Brown was the founder of, is the founder of the National Institute for Play. And he says that the truth is that play seems to be one of the most advanced methods nature has invented to allow a complex brain to create itself. The ability to play is critical not only to being happy, but also to sustaining social relationships and being a creative, innovative person. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So that being said, I want to invite us all to play. Um, so the first thing that I want us to do, and I hope there's space in the chairs, is actually for everyone to stand up, including our panel members. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for moving your, your things around. And I am going to give a set of instructions that I want you to respond to. Okay? That's the simple premise. So the first instruction is that when I clap once... I want everyone in the room to shout out very loudly their favorite food. Okay, so let's give that a go. Okay, I heard a lot of delicious things there. Now I'm going to clap twice, and when I clap twice, I want you to turn to your neighbor and give them a high five. So, any neighbor, any neighbor, you'll get chances to high five both, both neighbors. And then the third instruction is that when I clap three times, I want you to also clap three times. Amazing. Okay, so that was the warm-up. I'm now going to, we're now going to do the real thing, um, and it's going to be quick. I, I'm going to give you the instruction, and I want quick responses. Okay? So. Yeah. One for luck. Okay. Great. I'm feeling very hungry now. So I'm <laughs> thank you for playing. I invite you to sit back down. <laughs> Lots of great foods there. So, so we should be really proud of the kind of sophisticated skills that we were using to play that game. Um, we were understanding ourselves, when you know your preference for food. Uh, you were physically coordinating, so that your hands somehow managed to come together and clap. Um, you were listening to my instructions. Uh, you were paying attention and actually focusing on my instructions and then focusing on your response. So all of these skills we were already developing before the age of five. The exact skills that you just practiced there Children practice when they play one of our easy peasy games called band practice. So this is a really simple game. Um, you can see here one of our mums, she's taken pots, pans, spoons from the kitchen. Um, and she is asking her uh, three-year-old to 
respond to her instructions on the drums. So she'll give a set of um, rhythms and she'll ask for those rhythms to come back. So this child is really practicing all of that focus and attention that you just did now. So knowing how vitally important play is in the early years, as we all know um, so well today, it can be a real problem when that doesn't happen. Um, parents, when children lack those basic skills that they would have learned through learning through play, it can really harm their future education, health, um, their earning potential, generally their future success and well-being. So our solution at Easy Peasy has really been to give parents ideas, um, confidence, inspiration for ways that they can bring more, more play into the home. We've done that by creating an app, so parents can uh, watch short video tutorials of real families playing on their phone, so they can watch it wherever they are. So they really kind of get, get the confidence that they can go and play that game at home. Um, and we've worked to develop our app with a wide network of charities, businesses and governments so that we can reach as many families as possible with the service. So we're, we're evidence-led and we've really evaluated the impact of our app on families. And we know that when children play our games at home with their parent or caregiver, that they can actually progress five months in cognitive development, concentration, attention. Uh, we know that 20% more children in schools achieve their GLD. So this is the good level of development assessment that happens at the end of age five. And really importantly, we know that parents feel more confident and comfortable bringing more play into the home after using Easy Peasy. So what's been important for us is working with a large and growing community of families and really working with the early years practitioners who provide such vital support through their, um, for their families through the nurseries, schools and networks. Uh, we also work with like-minded people and organisations who, like us all here, really understand the importance of these crucial years and playing in these crucial years. Um, one of our big partners that we're really excited about this year is Welcome, um, and they're helping us to create game ideas, especially for the more little ones, so for 0 to 2. I'll be excited to get um, Jack's new, new little one into one of our games. Um, and they're also helping us really share this message more widely as well. So that's me coming to the end and, uh, and really kind of putting an invite out to you all here in this room to really help us share this message um, and to get involved in our mission. Um, that might be helping us develop our app or create new, new game ideas with us um, or helping us do some research that might be relevant to, to your studies and what you'll be going on to do afterwards. Um, you can sign up to look at all of our game ideas that you might find useful when working with, um, with children. Um, so please do come and check us out on our website here and feel free to drop me a line as well. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Jane. Matluba? I'm Matluba and I wear several hats. Um, that of a landscape architect, uh, a researcher and a teacher. And what I'm going to do today, try to bring all these hats together in this presentation. Uh, I'd like you all actually to think about your times at primary school. Um, what was your favorite place for play? Um, shall I give you some names and maybe you can put your hands up? Was it a backyard? Uh, a park? A playground? Just mm -hmm. school ground? Beach or your bedroom with video games? Oh, it seems like I didn't really tick all the boxes. Maybe some other new names will come from you? Any names? Well, what I can tell is that most of my favorite places were actually outdoors. But would you be surprised to see how less a child needs to play. So it's sometimes just a flip-flop 
or just a little, <laughs> or sometimes even nothing. But if you closely observe, you'll see that the girl is playing actually with sand on the ground. So play does happen in a place. And as a landscape architect, I co-create places with children and the community. And as a researcher, I evaluate those places for how that can impact on children's lives, um, on their health, learning, health, and well-being. And as a teacher, what I try to do, I try to enlighten future professionals, architects, landscape architects, or planners, in light of those evidence. So today, I'm going to share with you the story of redesigning this school ground, and redesigning this school ground with children, <coughs> teachers, and the community. I worked with children who already had rich experiences of play outside their school premises. So they interacted with nature, and yeah, so there are just fastness of nature outside their school environment where they would like to spend the most of their times. And in some cases, they would not even come to school because they loved it so much out outdoors. And I actually cannot blame them. <laughs> As you know, nature offers so much opportunities for diversified play. But that is a problem, right? Like, if I am not to go to school because of that. But how about we designed places, we designed places as an attractive place for children to come, to experience, and to learn. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that not really always populate the school grounds with play equipment that research says might not retain children for longer term. So children are attracted to different kind of play equipment for short term, but might not be longer term. So what we can do to design a place for play that can attract children towards school, that can retain children in school, that can offer more opportunities for play and also playful pedagogy. So to do that, I, I first asked children what they would like to have in their school. Children drew uh, what they wanted to have. And also I brainstormed with teachers what is needed there to engage children in play and also playful pedagogy. And we all participated in child-led model making exercise. And then we presented that model to the community. We asked them what they can do in terms of building it together. And in the end, we designed a place which is actually a combination of different settings where these settings offer different kind of opportunities. So we worked with local masons in the school and children themselves painted the mural on the school wall. And play didn't really cease to exist when the school ground was being built. Children were playing in there when it was being built. And you know, like how many of you loved construction site as a play space? It could be risky, <laughs> with a word of caution, but this was not that risky, but the, think about the loose materials available in a site like this for, with some risks for play, but of course. Um, so children enjoyed themselves, even when just being built. And then the schoolyard was ready. It had outdoor amphitheater, it had huts, a water play area, it had different different kind of settings offering diverse opportunities for play. <laughs> and once it is built, it's just play, it's just full on. And children were engaged in social play and physical play at the same time. So they were interacting with each other while swinging. That's very um, traditional, but yet very popular uh, play for, for children. They worked with loose materials, they created things with loose materials, 
They explored lives in water habitat. They created the habitat themselves in their schoolyard. And then they also had their teaching and learning outdoors. So teachers took their maths and sciences cl science classes outdoors on a regular basis. So this place became a very interesting place for playful pedagogy as opposed to the static and textbook century learning in the classroom. And then, then my researcher hat came in and I tried to evaluate the place, how the children used the place, whether what worked and what didn't work, and what I can learn from this place for future design or for future of my practice. And so we can see this is the use of the school before intervention. Um, all these dots are indicate, one dot indicates one child and the colors are the type of activities children were engaged in at different times of the day. And this is after the intervention. And you can see how diversified children's experiences, play experiences were in the school ground after they have worked together to build that school ground. And we, I also found out that children actually performed better in their exams after they have been taught outdoors for five months. It improved their well-being, it improved their motivation to learn. See, at, at, in a nutshell, a place that is co-created a place that offers diverse opportunities for play and playful, playful pedagogy can, can improve children's well-being, can improve children's academic attainment, and can give a meaning to what they do. And I think that's every child's right, according to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. And that's what actually I do um, for most of my time. And if you want to know more about my research, that uh, how I have taken this forward, do please give, drop me an email. And thank you. Thank you very much, Matt Luber, Holly. Hi. You look a bit sleepy. Are you feeling a bit sleepy now? Yeah, okay. So be how you are, and I'll see if I can meet you just where you are. I will start like a soothing lullaby. Um, I am what is known as a clown o therapist. What? What? I teach clowning to adults through a therapeutic process. Hmm, still no clearer. Okay, when I say the word clown, what do you see <coughs> in your minds? You can shout out and I'm going to shout it back. A red nose, moustache, circus, white face paint, big shoes, floppy hair, oh, fluffy hair. Anything else? What images come to mind when I say the word clown? What was that? Fire breathing. <laughs> fire engines, all the clowns in the fire engines. <laughs> mice. Mine, oh, mine. Yeah. Okay, so all of these images come to you just from this one word. When I say the word clown, you suddenly have a picture in your minds about what clown is. Well, I'm from the circus originally. I was brought up in the circus as a little person, but the kind of circus that we did was, it was called New Circus at the time, which was... Um, theatre and circus woven together. So we did kind of theatre shows with circus skills woven in. But I got really into clowning and it was my thing. So I travelled all over the world and I trained with loads of different clown teachers. You can go to clown school. You can go to clown school. <laughs> and it's all different. All over the world, they, they teach it in a lot of different ways. And I performed as a clown all over the place. I performed on the streets. I performed in theatres. I performed in schools. I performed in a public toilet. <laughs> I performed everywhere. And, well, sometimes you have to do these things. And when I was 30, I decided to retrain as a drama therapist. Ah. Now, when I say the word drama therapist, what do you see? What images do you see? Actor, drama. Shout. 
somebody lying on a couch and the therapist doing Shakespeare. <laughs> to be or not to be? <laughs> Yeah, it's quite a weird concept, isn't it, thinking about drama therapy? Well, it's kind of similar to music therapy. So you've heard of music therapy, yeah, and art therapy as well. So you're kind of using these creative tools to find out something about yourself. So with drama therapy, we use story and we use characters to try and find a little bit more about ourselves. So when it came to my dissertation for my master's in drama therapy, it was obvious that I wanted to find a way to bring clowning and drama therapy together. So I ran a research group for adults with mental health issues. So I worked with people with bipolar and anxiety and depression. And we explored clowning for therapeutic benefit. Uh, and we came out with clownotherapy. Yeah, I'm the only one doing it. There's nobody else that's doing it. I'm the one that's doing it. And people come from all over the UK and beyond to come to my workshops to try out this clowning method to learn something about themselves. So the kind of clowning that I'm interested in is really, it's just finding all the weird bits of you, like all the weird quirky bits that you try not to let anybody see. Uh, it's finding all of that and turning it up, making it bigger until it becomes completely ridiculous. Would you like a demo? Okay. Would you? I, who's frightened of clowns? Good. Close your eyes. <laughs> oh. doing with my clowning. <laughs> so I'm encouraging people to feel their impulses and turn it up. Do the things that you're probably not really supposed to do. So that's what clowning does. It allows people to kind of follow their impulses, their natural impulses. Um, so clowning for me is a state that dissolves reality. So in dissolving reality, we create space for possibility. This is what Michael Rosen was talking about earlier, this space for possibility. So it, with clowns, everything they see is a potential game. Every object they see oh, could be turned into something. So you can do this just where you are. With, if you've got a pen in your hand, for instance, what could this pen be? If, if it wasn't a pen, if you didn't know what a pen was and you held this object up, what could it be? Find three things you could do with that pen. Yeah, it could be a knife. <laughs> yeah, what else could you use that pen for? Yeah, writing. Yeah, sure, writing. Oh, measuring. I'm seeing some measuring happening in the middle. Anybody else got any ideas? <laughs> oh, yeah, you could scratch your butt. <laughs> so a clown thinks outside the box. A clown picks up an object, and suddenly an object takes on infinite possibilities. And in that, it creates space. There's enormous amounts of space. And with what I'm doing with clowning, with clownotherapy, I'm encouraging people to use this sense of spaciousness on their sense of self. Oh. So, <laughs> so we can, uh, like for instance, I have labels. This is how I identify myself. I identify as a clown, first and foremost. I identify as a drama therapist. I identify as a teacher. I identify as a woman. I identify as white, and I identify as Welsh, I identify as Jewish heritage, I identify as somebody from Bristol, uh, I identify as a vegetarian, you know. So these labels are what make me up, this, this makes up my personality, and these labels are really important, it's how we get a sense of who we are, it's how we find our sense of belonging, and it's how we find our tribe. So I'm quite interested in your labels, finding out a few of your labels, so with a partner, somebody you're, ne you're near to, you're going to take it in turns to say, well how do you identify, what labels do 
do you identify as? Take it in turns, so with a partner. That's enough labels. Um, anybody want to shout a few out? What was that? Biker. Biker. Wow, that's a good one. Anyone else want to shout one out? Husband. Husband, yeah. <laughs> Student, yeah. Yeah, so these labels, they, they can give us a sense of ourselves, but also they can limit us. If we get attached to these labels as, as being who we are, then there's no space for us to be anything else. And so with clownotherapy, I encourage people to jump into these labels and play from the inside. So I'm going to play with being a student. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boring. Oh, so boring. It's so unfair. I have to do so much work. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. oh, it's so hard. Oh. That's me as a student. <laughs> So in playing with our parts of the self, we can find more space, we can find more possibility, we can find, we can make space for the unknown, the unexpected. Uh, the final way that space features in my work is about safe space. I create safe space for adults to play, adults to let their guard down and play freely. It takes some work because adults are rubbish at playing. <laughs> A lot of the adults that come to my workshops are terrified. They're absolutely terrified about playing. Why do you think this is? Why do adults stop playing? They shout it out. Age, because they get so old they can't play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, responsibility. It's really heavy. It's like, oh, God, I've got to pay the mortgage. Yeah, what else? They don't like mess. They don't like mess. They're like, oh, no, it's going to be too messy. I can't play. Yeah. What? What is that? Child. Oh, it, they, they become mature. No, I'm a mature person. I don't play. I'm very, very grown up and important. I don't play anymore. Yeah, it's true. But um, I think it's ridiculous because play is important to everybody, whatever your age is, whether you're kids or whether you're adults. Play is essential because through play we can learn, we can grow, we can experience, we can expand, and play is crucial. So to provide safe space for my, my people, my students that come and study with me, I, there are several things that I do to help people feel like they can let their guard down. So like boundaries, at the beginning I state the boundaries boundaries, what's okay for us to do here, what's not okay for us to do here. So people are clear about how far they can go in the play space. And things like optionality. So everything's always optional. They can join in or they can choose not to join in. That's really important for adults to have that feeling of power. Like I am choosing to join in or I'm choosing not to join in. On, on, a lot of the time it makes people feel happier to jump in just having permission to not do it. And the other one is permission to play as you are. So a lot of adults have this idea about, oh, play is really big and energetic, and uh, oh, I've got to be really quick to play, or I've got to be really funny to play. I can't possibly do that. So I say, well, no, why not play just as you are? So if you're tired, just find a tired way to play. And if you're nervous, then find a nervous way to play. So f let play find you instead of trying to be this playful person that apparently you can't get anywhere near. Another one I do is uh, positive feedback. So there's only positive feedback in my workshops. There's no criticism at all, which helps people to feel safe to be silly and to be vulnerable and to not worry that um, they're going to get told off about anything. And the last one is confidentiality. I mean, you should see what they do in my workshops. There's people like rolling around on the floor and there's feathers and there's balloons and there's stuffed animals and they're doing all... Col and, and like these are like, you know, everyday people from all kinds of jobs. There's like IT consultants there, there's like uh, PhD students there, there's like therapists there, there's like teachers there. Like, like every, all, all kinds of adults come to my workshop. So to keep them safe in this play space, I ask them to keep it confidential so they don't, they don't talk about what other people are doing in the play space. It's a secret. Um, and I, I don't know, I've just finished with 
just dropping in, and I'm glad that they brought me in because that most of this day has been geared towards thinking about children and play, but it, play doesn't stop at the end of childhood. Play carries on and on and on and on, and, and it should, because the more playful we can be, the more play that we can inspire in the people around us. So um, keep playing, don't stop playing. It doesn't have to stop. We don't have to be grown-ups. The end. <laughs> Holly, and I think let play find you is fantastic advice for life, full stop. Could I have the two mics up, please? And can I have our first question? So if we have hands up, people who've got a question, fantastic. And I want to see two, it helps me if I can see two more hands up with questions ready, just before we start, just so I know we're not going to get stuck as we progress. Fantastic. I presume, sir, or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to have another teacher, sorry, so it's going to have to be another student. There we, I'm guessing you're a student, obviously it's hard to tell. So we've got, so we'll have one, two, three. Have we got, do we know where those are going? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, can you say the school that you're from so okay. I can award the points? Um, I'm from Brampton. And Brampton. You stated that play can be different. We all have different thought processes and different mentors. So, um, you said that play, you help people clown with like mental disorders, so anxiety and depression. Um, everybody's thought process is different, so how would you influence a person to relax um, with certain different, like, because mental disorders like schizophrenia are different to anxiety, so your um, brain waves are completely different, so how would you influence a person to relax and just play? Yeah, I mean, what I was saying, that it's encouraging people to play as they are, but also, I, I do a lot of trust building in my classes, so we do a lot of trust exercises and getting to know you, and, we, and it's very simple, step by step, for people to gradually drop into the kind of crazier levels of play, because I think a lot of people suffer with anxiety, it's tough for a lot of people to, um, to let their guard down and to, and to be silly. So, yeah, the I mean, the boundaries really support the space and people knowing what they're signing up to. So they have to apply for my courses. It's not an accident that they end up in my courses. <laughs> they have to apply um, and they have to sign a disclaimer that they're going to take care of themselves during the weekend. Um, but, yeah, so, so I, I, I guess telling people what they're getting themselves into is important and then the boundaries when they're actually in the space and then all the trust building that happens, the essential trust building. You can't do the deep, kind of crazy work until the trust is there. I think with any kind of therapy, that's kind of the first thing that you do, really, is building trust. Did that answer your question? Does anyone want to follow on from that, perhaps? <coughs> I think you particularly got the trust in the community faith placed yeah. in you, Manuba. I think that's um, particularly when we work with the community and children. It's definitely trust building is the first step to do and it's just a, we can't really parachute an idea from one place to another and it really it's some sometimes it takes time to, to do that trust building but I think there are methods through which we can actually engage community parents <coughs> and children and of course sometimes um, the playful methods can be used with parents and the community as well particularly the model making, and those are quite playful and uh, that can be used to engage them um, um, in a more kind of, I would say, quicker or faster way um, in, in the level of, of, of trust that, that we can work on. Well, well, if I can. <laughs> so when we were in the green room earlier, you were talking about um, data coming back from parents and allowing so the individual kind of things that was happening between parent and child could be fed back into your app. Mm -hmm. And obviously the question about the in working with individual children and how does that work with you in the online space? Yeah, so it completely, you know, for us it's, it, those interactions are so key um, to, to kind of all the wonderful things that happen in play, you know, especially between parents and caregivers and their children. It's that, the warmth of that interaction that can actually sometimes be preventative for, you know, certain mental health issues. Um, so when we, you know, come to the app, we uh, make sure that we're always learning from parents about what um, they find really useful and what they find builds their confidence or really gives them the inspiration so that we can keep providing more of that and keep providing more of the types of games and activities that they find useful. Um, so it's kind of that real, you know, the, the type of data that allows us to personalise our content. Mm -hmm. 
um, so it can really support them. Fantastic. Any more questions on technology, just out of interest? Any really thoughts or comments even? Very free to take a comment from anywhere in the room about how smartphones or TV or computer games are affecting play. <coughs> well, we can come back to that. Can we have Sir? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, from B6. Um, are there any cultural considerations when designing or creating play? Yeah, definitely. I think when we design a place, because it's in, in a particular climatic and cultural context, and this climate definitely also influences the culture in many ways. Um, so, it, oh, designing a specific place, that, that's where we work with the community and the parents and children, and th that actually helps to, to find out the cultural aspects of what should be there. But, but interestingly, because um, children's needs and aspirations are quite universal, that's, that's, that's something I have uh, found out through my years of research in England, Scotland, and in Bangladesh, that no matter, and also in refugee camps, no matter where, where children are, they have it. The, when we ask them what you want to do um, in your everyday life to, to engage in play, what kind of places do you want, um, most of them, so they, they want places where they can engage with nature, connect with nature, where they can be physically active, where they can find challenges, uh, and where they can interact with others, with peers and, and um, older adults and younger children. So interaction, physical activity challenges, <coughs> risk taking, uh, and also nature, these are kind of important features that are quite universal across many countries. and different cultural contexts. And it's just when we design them, keeping these main ideas in mind, then the particular like specific features of the place could be different. Um, thinking of like when it's raining or uh, like de depending on the climate or other things. But um, to some extent, um, children's needs are very uh, universal. We find it particularly important when we're designing our game ideas to work with families from you know, a whole you know, cross-section of different cultures. Um, you know, there are so many traditions in play, um, so many different traditions, so nursery rhymes, for example, um, are relevant in some cultures and not in others. So by us working with a diverse range of, of families from different cultures and taking game ideas from them, we can then you know, start to represent things that feel relevant to people. I think we still have more work to do with that. Um, but for us, it's, it's about that kind of initial um, workshopping that we do with families and making sure we're being diverse. I have, um, so I work with some clown companies that go out to areas of recovery after um, natural disaster or man-made disaster. So I train up clowns in this country who go over and, and play. And there are cultural, um, specific cultural limitations that we have to think about in the countries that we go to. So I have a group of clowns that go over to Palestine that, have, that aren't allowed to show their flesh when they're, when they're clowning. They have to make sure they're completely covered up. Um, and and there's certain touch that is not appropriate. Um, and they found out trial and error, really, by, um, by trying stuff and having a really terrible reaction from the audience and then talking to people going, oh, oh uh, we've really crossed the line here. So we do have to learn about local what's, what's, what's appropriate. But the thing with the, the clown, it trans transgresses boundaries. Uh, the nature of the clown is to open up space around them wherever they go. And so part, part of what we do with clowning is to, is to kind of look at cultural norms and, and play a little bit on the fringes of the boundaries, go, is it OK if I just try this a little bit? Oh, no, OK, no, that's not OK. But um, clowns don't really know about social appropriacy. They don't know about taboo. Um, so they can, yeah, they can kind of cross over those borders with innocence, a little bit of innocence, and call those kind of cultural norms into consciousness to, to yeah. Although the, the clowns that I work with that go out to refugee camps, it's really important that they're sticking within 
the cultural norms of whoever it is that they're playing with because they don't want to alienate the kids. They don't want to push the kids away. The whole thing about going to refugee camps is to create connection, to create play with kids. So, yeah, they try and respect the norms as much as they can. Mm. Um, I was just a just comment, so at the South London Gallery, uh, the art and play team is primarily comprised of people who've grown up in the local area themselves in Peckham and Camberwell. And I think that is really important that uh, children are seeing people representative of, them, of themselves um, in all the work they're doing. Um, and I also think it's important that uh, children and young people have exposures to difference and people different to themselves. So it's, that's a bit of a, can be a balance in terms of all of us in terms of learning about each other's cultures. But that representation needs to be at the core of what you're doing, in my opinion. Um, question number three. What made you... Sorry, oh. what school are you from? And can I have two more hands go up as well? Grey Court and... Sorry, what? say that again? Grey Court. Grey Court, wicked. Lovely. What made you want to become, like, a clown and go into that kind of business? I was born into it, so I was born into the circus, um, and I've tried to leave several times. In fact, when I went to train as a drama therapist, I really thought I was getting out. Uh, <laughs> but then there's something about the clown, it's like, it's so... I love the connection that, that can be made through clowning, and I'm, I'm really into that, and so the clown has become my vehicle for promoting connection, for helping people to come out of their own little bubbles and to come into the world, into connection. So, yeah, I can't, I tr I've tried so hard to run away from the circus, but it's never going to happen. I've given up now. <laughs> Could we extend that question to, obviously, you're not both clowns. <laughs> but although we've all got thoughts now that you know you can go to school to do it. But perhaps... Okay. Um, so, I was born into a family of teachers. Um, my, my father is a teacher, and all my sisters are. So, when I enrolled myself into architecture school to become an architect, uh, I, th I thought that I, uh, because um, I was aware of some of the challenges teachers face when they teach children uh, in primary schools and also other aspects of limitation of space um, and the quality of space. So I, I thought that it would be a good idea to explore how to design space for learning. Um, and that's where actually the, the exploration for for designing place for play and playful learning um, begin. Um, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, <coughs> my background, so I, I was very interested in psychology from a young age. Um, I think as can often happen, it's not always, but you know, something might happen in your life that makes you kind of from a young age want to reflect. And for me, um, that was my father passing away. And I think ever since then, um, I was always interested in people's emotions and how you can kind of recover from setback and how you can um, develop resilience. Um, so I, I went on to study. Um, I did cognitive science at University of Leeds and then did my master's in psychology of education and just continued to be really interested particularly in how um, <laughs> you know, learners can learn and how that, you know, that sense of learning, that sense of playing can really help them through, through tough times. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was really glad, glad to find Easy Peasy, which really summed up, um, you know, some of the work that I've done in play, but through a digital form. So it was able to reach many more families, uh, you know, across the country and also globally now. Okay. Wonderful. It was over here. Where was the hand? There we go. Derek Wood. Sorry? Derek Wood. Fantastic. So yeah. within the community playgrounds, you kind of help spring to build, which structure do you think made the most impacts on the kids and also helped everyone in the community? Um, that's very interesting because, yeah, we looked into, as, as I said, like, we did, we did design the school ground as a combination of different settings. So there are many different settings, like an amphitheater for outdoor classroom, a water area um, uh, to engage with water. So what we found it, interestingly, when children are engaged in free play, the places, the settings they're engaged in free play, um, were quite different than wh what they, when they were engaged in, in outdoor classes. And interestingly, we found that um, all the settings, settings have different, different kind of, um, offer different kind of opportunities for play in the, in the school ground. And the ending was that the, a combination of different settings 
no matter uh, how small the school ground is or wherever it is, it's always creating as many opportunities as possible for play that is important. Um, but having said that, we found that the um, outdoor classroom and amphitheater was a very popular place um, among children. Um, so was um, the water area um, and, and the huts. They, they really love the huts to actually to contemplate even alone. So I think that that is also a part of play to be able to sit alone and think and reflect. Um, so yeah, so, but, but I would say that uh, as landscape architects, we really do need to offer as many opportunities as possible, but not really overcrowding them, but also let children kind of um, finish some things. So a, a playground is, should never be a kind of complete perfect looking playground. It always should have also um, loose parts or parts that are not complete, that children can complete, that children can be engaged with and uh, make that their kind of own, give an identity to them or attach their own identity with that. Holly, do you have a top game that you, sorry, no, Jane, <laughs> is there a top game that, uh, or activity on your app that people return to as most impactful? Um, band, band practice is a real loved one. Um, and also, you know, we, most of our games actually don't include any props at all. Um, so you can play them you know, on the bus or while you're out and about. Um, and one thing which is a really simple game idea that lots of people might have done when they were younger is um, Tower of Hands. So you have to build a tower of hands um, with your parent, your pet caregiver, um, you know, you've got to count the number of hands that you can build. You can go up, you can go down, you can go sideways. Um, so that's something that people can do anywhere um, in any language. Amazing. We had a question here, right? Fantastic. Um, you all do like really different jobs. So, what kind of boundaries do you think that you all face, like on a regular basis, in trying to improve, like, play for children or for adults as well? That's an amazing question. What school are you from? Um, Brampton. Fantastic. <coughs> what, the what, are the, what are the barriers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are the boundaries that impact you on your work? So let's start with you, Matt Luba. OK, so um, yeah, there are actually, um, I had to overcome a lot of barriers and challenges whenever I worked with, with schools uh, in terms of uh, developing their, their school yards. Um, um, it, also in terms of designing spaces for play, particularly when it's um, teachers are sometimes really overburdened with, with, with responsibilities and also they are guided by set, uh, it, it depends, curriculum is different across different countries and sometimes curriculum are too prescribed to do different things and that, do not, that doesn't allow teachers to actually maybe go beyond their usual structure and uh, try something playful. So I think some, this policy regulation, so having the curriculum to, to encourage children, teachers actually, to motivate teachers in t trying something new, trying something playful, that, that, that is one first big step. But also I'd say most challenges are, are, are related to policies and how, how policies are made, how, how limiting now a days that how school grounds are kind of uh, uh, diminishing, like captured or um, taken away from, from the schools by the policies to build uh, um, something new. Um, and also how nowadays at, um, a, an interesting challenge is to actually uh, sometimes convince uh, teachers and parents that outdoor can be actually a place for learning. Uh, and, and play is play is always part of learning, but not always outdoors is seen as a kind of place for learning. So that, that was the first step also to, to convince them in, in that sense. And we talked about trust building with the community and um, and also convinced that this, this can actually improve academic attainment. That, that was another thing. So we are just so, um, I think sometimes carried away with that term like closing the attainment gap. But this could be one way towards closing the attainment gap, which is actually seen as not really towards that way, seen taking children away from their learning time to play. 
So that, that is a notion that we really need to fight with. So. Any boundaries you're for, for having to overcome um, very quickly? Um, I feel like I've built my business around um, what I need to do. So I can't really work in institutions. I've tried, but because I'm so wacky, it doesn't really work. So I've tried teaching in universities. I've tried teaching in nursery schools. Um, and... Yeah, I had similar barriers with teachers not willing to kind of jump in and to kind of uh, have really wide open play spaces, which is where I feel like the best learning takes place, is within boundaried, open, free learning spaces. So I've built my business around what I need to do, which is uh, be free, be free to play, be free to respond, be free to grow. Um, and so, yeah, it's the only way I could do it is by being self-employed and doing it my way. So there are no barriers because I do whatever I want. <laughs> Jane? Yeah, I think for us, um, one of the biggest um, you know, things that we are there to support is, is um, parents' confidence. I think you've touched on that a fair bit, Harley, you know, the confidence to play. And, um, you know, not all parents understand their influence as children's primary educator. So, you know, the EPSI study, the longitudinal study that found that um, you know, home learning that happens at home with the parent or the caregiver um, is more predictive of future, future success than preschool education. And not many parents understand the importance of what they do at home um, or have the kind of confidence. You know, they get back from work, they don't really have time, um, they're in their logical mind, they're not really feeling like doing pretend play or setting up a game. Um, so for us, it's, it's really, yeah, overcoming that, that kind of lack of confidence mm -hmm. and finding ways that we can do that through an app. Fantastic. Uh, we have to... Okay. <laughs> Very quick question and an exceptionally quick two, two or three word answers. Go. Um, uh, I'm from Brampton. And from I just Brampton? Want, yeah. I was wondering, because being Bangladeshi myself, um, it made me really happy to know that Bangladesh is ma being made like a focal point in the project. But I was wondering if um, you got, uh, were planning on like, moving out or like, expanding the project to any other countries. Oh, um, yeah, so I, this work is in Bangladesh, but I also work with schools in, uh, work with schools in um, Scotland and England, um, and... Uh, so, yes. Yes. Holly. <laughs> <laughs> <Next. laughs> uh, it's funding out. <laughs> Are we going global? We are. So I'm looking into teacher training now. I'm looking to t t train up other teachers so that we can get this thing going all over the world. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. The internet yeah. is everywhere, right? The internet is everywhere. And we have just gone global <laughs> this summer. So yeah, we have parents from Madrid, the US, all um, playing our games as well. Cool. I'll be keeping it local always. But that's just the way I work. Uh, thank you very much to the welcome. Thank you very much to this fantastic panel. Um, and if you've got any more questions, you're open to emails, yep. anything else. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.